Squadron! Welcome back to Dark Souls 2 Appreciation Time. <laughs> Final lore and chill episode before we jump into Dark Souls 3 this Monday. I'm literally going to be recording the first episode tomorrow. It's going to be so much fun. I cannot wait to see you guys on Monday. Yes, I'm not wearing a hat. I cut my own hair. I don't think it looks that bad, to be honest. Let me know. Okay, now it does. Anyways, if you haven't read the title, we're doing Prepare to Cry Dark Souls 2 by the man himself, Adi Vidya. We're going to do the trailer. We're going to do Sin, the Slumbering Dragon, Sirloin, and the Iron King, the Ivory King, Lucatiel. You know the drill. I cannot wait to learn more about these characters and uh, wrap up Dark Souls 2 for good, at least for the foreseeable future, before we get into Dark Souls 3. So, thank you for being here. Make sure to leave a like. It helps out the channel. It helps us grow as a community and without further ado let's jump in all right guys we're gonna start with the trailer it's only three minutes long we're gonna see uh you know just to get hyped and i completely forgot to light up my candle man jesus christ this is it's lauren chill man all right you guys can't even see it but it's it's right there man all right here we go prepare to cry trailer everything ends what even the brightest bonfire will fade to embers we've no. all seen that before embers holding on to a fragile flame you had a life before this there was a woman, a home, a child, a curse. Your woman, your home, your child, right? Wait, what? <laughs> I thought that was my mom. I thought I was the baby. Should I? <laughs> I guess not. I guess that was my wife. Well, again, Fadi Video does speculate a lot. And this video did come out nine years ago, but it's still a classic. We're still going to do this. That's my wife. What happened to them? You don't remember. Shit. What you do remember is the curse. You struggle against it, but it consumes you, and you experience death. Huh. And in death, you dream. You dream of a lost kingdom. A murky, forgotten land. A place where souls may mend your ailing mind. Then you live once again. <laughs> Who I thought I had passed out and then just woke up again. I guess I died and was born again. That's that's pretty damn cool, man. And honestly, going back to the cinematic, which I thought was super fucking cool, the DS2 cinematic, I'm very excited for the Dark Souls 3 cinematic. I just know it's going to be glorious. And I just, I'm so excited, man. Who were you before you died? When did you get to this forest? Doesn't matter. Push on. Right. But you're tired. So tired. Now, all you remember is that your memory is fading. But wasn't there something else? There were important memories. They were everything to you. Now they've melted away, and you're agonized by their loss. It all makes sense. You're aggrieved by this curse. And so you throw away everything you used to be, and gain a new purpose. Discover the origins of the curse, and use the legendary souls of Drangleic to maintain your sanity. But soon you realize you're not the only one who journeyed to Drangleic with this goal. Drangleic. Once Drangleic was a mighty kingdom, led by a wise king so and a cool, mighty queen. So cool, man. But giants from a far off land waged war with the kingdom to reclaim something that was stolen from them. The giants were repelled, but the weakened kingdom soon fell victim to the curse of the undead. <laughs> Hollowed soldiers overcame the lands, and the king who once had the strength to lead his people also found the strength to fight them. But something went wrong. The king has locked himself away, and no one has seen the queen. The kingdom of Drangleic is in decay. Everything will crumble and waste away so that something new may be born. Drangleic. It bears resemblance to a place we once knew. A world with struggle between light and dark. A kingdom with a sinner, a king, a doomed betrayer, and a mass of the dead. A land where the curse of men reflects the curse of the world. Every flame turns to ashes. Kingdoms rise and fall, some light, some dark, all struggling for new beginnings with a fragile flame trying to survive among the embers. But perhaps struggling is the fire's ordinary state. The curse of life is the curse of want, and so you peer into the fog in hope of answers. Oh, shit, dude. Oh, that was this so video fire. was made slightly better because of the 408 people who kindled this channel. If you shout out the people who kindled this channel, if you if you want to kindle this channel, you know, feel free to subscribe, man. Yeah, I'm so excited for this. That was sick. All of a sudden, we just understand the story completely now. I know we watched the lore uh, a couple days ago, but that 
just minute and a half in the beginning. Everything that I need to know, man. It's it was it was perfect. All right, guys. So next up, we're gonna do. I don't know if there's an order to this. I'm just on Vadi Vidya's playlist. But next up, it seems to be Sin the Slumbering Dragon. So that's what we're gonna do. This boss was the one that made me feel the most epic out of the entire game, the OST, the arena. The way the dragon just woke up and just spewed fire, it was just perfection. I consider this the first boss of the DLC. I'm sure we'll know more about the queen in, in, in the upcoming video, but this boss was so damn good, man. You have a dragon with poison in his heart, and it's the story of the race that discovered him, worshipped his magnificence, but ultimately perished by his side. Damn. Dragons have always been intriguing to humanity, with many believing they hold the secrets to life itself. One who believed this was Vendrick, King of Dranglaic, and his brother Aldia. Together they experimented on dragons, in the hopes that they could learn more about their existence. Eventually, they were successful, recreating an ancient dragon <laughs> with the ability to peer into the past, so to cool. view the stories of old so that they might learn from them. This is one such story. In the ancient dragon Ziri, before the chamber with the dragon's egg, is a mural that depicts an ancient civilization who existed long ago, deep below the deepest depths. Legend has it that deep below the earth, behind a door locked from the inside, is a magnificent city built for a great slumbering dragon. In a bygone age, the king in the depths built his city around this beast. This subterranean world centered around the great sanctum that housed the dragon in its depths and was aptly named Shulva, the Sanctum City. The first time we entered Shulva, like, I was absolutely blown away. It was one of those moments where, like, you just see something and you're like, wow, like, this, the scale of it was unreal, man. This was a great way to, to start the three DLCs. That was the first time in this game that I felt, like, true scale and seeing the dragon right at the beginning and him flying away. It was the coolest thing, man. This was coolest a religious thing. city where sorceries were considered taboo, but miracles flourished as the people there were grounded in their faith. The people prayed and worshipped, and the priestesses sang to soothe the dragon in its slumber. <laughs> One wonders whether a single phrase of their song ever reached the dragon's ears, but to people of faith such questions matter not. As is common, the, the king, king had, had a dear queen. queen. And the queen sang to the dragon also. That boss apparently can summon, I, I forget his name now, but the one we fight right before finding Vendrick, like Vendrick's guardian protector. Apparently she's supposed to summon that guy and she didn't summon him for me. And honestly, I kind of wish she did because her fight was kind of on the easier side. Because of that, I was a little bit over level two, but that's why I said Sin kind of felt like the first boss of the DLC. Just because, I don't know, she kind of left me with a lot to be desired, but still pretty cool. Pretty cool. I love the thing she said, like her dialogue right as you enter the room. That shit, was, that shit was epic. At this point in our story, you should know that the dragon has a tragic secret. Deep within him, Sin harbors a dreadful store of poison. Damn. And there will come a time where he cannot bear it any longer. Looking back, it's impossible to know whether the people knew of the poison, or even if the dragon himself knew. Perhaps the people of the city prayed, sang, and soothed out of fear. Fear that the waking of the dragon would lead to their demise. If so, this could only serve to strengthen their faith, for fear is the heart of reverence, and the people revered their magnificent sleeping beast, the center of their faith. It should come as no surprise to you that men would come to cover the dragon. To the Drake Blood Knights, fresh dragon blood was sacrosanct. They believed that by obtaining it, they could come to a true understanding of life, allowing them to transcend their own pointless existence. Classic. In a world where strength of purpose keeps one from hollowing, a belief like this isn't so strange. Led by Soyorg and his famous spear, the Drake Blood Knights lay siege to Shulva. <laughs> the King crazy. of Shulva called his Sanctum Knights to arms many of whom renounced their own flesh to eternally guard the sanctum from the assault of Sir Yorg and his Drake Blood Knights. They were sentenced to eternal stewardship, yet soon the day would come where the sanctum received nary a visitor. During the conflict, the dragon slept, lulled by the Queen's song. You have to wonder who sent Sir Yorg and his Drake Blood Knights, so look now at the crest upon the ring of Sir Yorg and see the truth of things. This is the crest of Drang Lake. So mm. Yorg, leader of the Drake Blood Knights and possibly of Vendrick's kingdom, cuts down the soldiers of the Sanctum and kills the King in the Depths. Jesus. He then faces the slumbering dragon. 
With visions of dragon blood and omniscience, Sayorg pierces the dragon with a flash of his steel, piercing Sin through the chest. And as you can imagine, it wasn't what he was expecting. Uh, Sin immediately awakens, and from his wound spews forth the deadly poison that had long been brewing within him. It blankets the entire city in a miasmic cloud, oh, restoring shit. the dragon's purity, but toppling the city. So Jorg and his Drakeblood knights disappeared into the sanctum, and nothing more was heard of the race that discovered a dragon and worshipped its magnificence. <laughs> Damn, that sucks. Until now. There have been many kings and kingdoms, hierarchies that rose and fell, leaving ruined kingdoms behind. We visit the memories of Vendrick, king of his own unraveled kingdom. I am no king. Vendrick's voice is like the freaking it's so good man it's just so good i someone mentioned his voice is also somebody from uh from bloodborne that i'm not remember no sorry from dark souls one a character that looked like it was from bloodborne i think it was the guy from the uh from the dlc if i'm remembering correctly someone correct me in the comments but vendrick's voice number one uh voice acting in the game number two that dude from uh from the luna place <laughs> Do you wish to ring the bell? You guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, that guy's fucking goaded. And uh, number three would probably be... Oh, what a sick voice. I mean, I'd probably have to go with the Emerald. I mean, her voice, just oh, perfection. Oh, the cat's pretty good, too. Fit to be a jester. I was unaware of my own blindness. We are feeble vessels with feebler souls. We would cast aside the prop of life only to face greater hardship. Are you another such fool? Or something more? I am a fool. Seeker of fire. Conqueror of dark. Conqueror. Do you intend to link the fire? No. Then you must first take the throne. Prove your worth. Find the ancient crowns. Seek adversity and they will be yours. And your wishes. Granted. I'm starting to realize we never got that dialogue. I think we started the DLC and then after the first DLC, we got his first dialogue, which wasn't this. That's pretty cool. The, how he sends you on a quest to find the crowns. Like, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty hype. Somewhere within the sanctum is the crown of the sunken king. The crown of a king who came before Vendrick. The crown of a king who was killed by Sir Yorg on the day that the dragon awoke. We explore the ruined sanctum and we uncover the truths that it holds. The soldiers in the sanctum are now undead, coated with the corrosive poison of the dragon, but still carrying out their orders to defend the sanctum from outsiders. Throughout the sanctum, we find open chests, yes. which are a tribute to the grave robbers and thieves who uh, have flocked to this place. Oh, these bastards. Yeah, I never killed them. I probably never will. So annoying, dude. So annoying. Sin the sleeping dragon else to say. now roams his domain, sleeping lightly where he pleases. He even clears a bridge for us at one point, killing the two soldiers that block our path. Dragons in all the lore have always kept to themselves. They either think themselves above man or do not care for his conflicts. They are above man. You have man. to wonder about Sin. Did he harbor malicious intent? He had poison in his heart, but when he was pierced by York's spear, the poison gushed out and restored his purity. This implies he was pure before, which suggests that the poison was placed within him. Hmm. But by whom? We find an answer in the sanctum, right before sin. You. Right. Forever. You shall rot. You shall Alana. rot. That reminded me so much of uh, Millennia's kind of uh, little dialogue uh, before the second phase. Now you will rot, I think is what she said. No, I think I was, before, I think I was at the beginning of the fight. Second fight, she says, you shall witness true horror or something like that, which is still goes down as one of the hardest fucking lines a boss has ever said to me. Squalid Queen <laughs> once again sings to Sin, the slumbering dragon. After the kingdom is ruined by Sin's awakening, she remains alone. I believe Alana sang the Song of Poison into the dragon's heart mm. and was at least partly responsible for the fall of the sunken king, just like her sister Nishandra was responsible for the fall of Drang Lake. True. Nothing explicitly confirms Alana's intentions, except the pattern that repeats itself. We are discovering that all great kings have queens that lay in wait, waiting for the right moment to strike, and it's easy to believe that the queen of the Sanctum City was partly responsible for its fall. 
Ilana defends her sunken kingdom with a mixture of fire, dark, and most notably, poison and filth. Her essence is that of filth there he is. and neglect. She even summoned Valstad. That was his name, not the other dude. My bad. As a depraved replica of the king's hand, Valstad, completing the image of a queen devoted to making a mire of the world. After we conquer Alana, we learn who she was from her soul. Secret of fire. I see you've subdued another foul creature. <laughs> One of the father of the abyss spawn. That oh. confounded quintessence of humanity. Menace. The abyss once had form, but then dissipated. So and yet, cool. Traces of its existence endured. Each fragment, thirsting for power, spread dark with no relent. My dear Chandra was one such fragment. A feeble, tiny thing that thirsted for power more than any other. Driven by insatiable lust for a worthy vessel. All queens thus far are the children of the sentient abyss that existed long ago. They are the pieces that regained form in ways that hint at humanity's true nature. They seek to be whole once again. Alana, the queen of the Sanctum King, is a child of wrath. She's gathering souls and power from the slumbering dragon in anticipation of the coming day of vengeance. Oh. Her sister, Nishandra, the queen of Drangleic, is a child of want. The king's dear Chandra seeks the throne and the power to reshape the world that comes with it. For this, she needs a vessel. Nishandra guards the throne. Alana guards a crown. I'm sure a third sister lies in the remains of the old Iron King's kingdom, and we've yet to see her. It appears that the sisters are keeping the crowns and the throne warm, mm. waiting for some day of reckoning where they avenge their father. Every king wow. of light has had a fragment of Manus undoing their efforts from the start. Like Vendrick says, the brighter the flame, the deeper their shadow. Sin's death was a result of our desire for the crown of the sunken king, for it is now our job to gather the crowns and link the fire. We aim to be a lord of light that the previous kings weren't, and we will succeed in this. <laughs> but what if we have a queen of our own? Bearer of the curse. Seek so I will always oh, be at your side. Yes, you will. Until hope has fully withered. God, I just got chills, bro. That was so fire, man. Let's just jump in right into the second one. Oh, the third one. Oh, it's the second one. First one was a trailer. Sirloin and the Iron King. This so far has been... This is already so good, man. A man is defined by his ambitions. Facts. Before the Iron Crown, all the young lord had was an iron will. Little known and unestablished, the lord held some power, but he wanted a kingdom to match his pride. So with ambition alone, he raised an army and threw his entire might against the kingdom of Ven. Bro, this is fire. Ven was not a desirable region, but even so, the lord lost much to acquire it. He wrested this small throne from its previous ruler and became a king. <laughs> this act left him enfeebled. What the, f <laughs> what the fuck is that? That's Babyface with a beard, man. He's come back. He's made a comeback. Yeah, this makes me think. Dark Souls 3, what kind of character are we actually making? Because I haven't made a character since Dark Souls 1. <laughs> and I don't even think the character creation was that detailed. And I think Dark Souls 3 has like a more detail closer to like Elden Ring character creation. So let me know if you have any suggestions down below for what we should look like. I kind of want to go, you know, I don't want to do Babyface anymore. You know, premature fetus, long gone. I'm going for an elderly, maybe a handsome fella, you know, Prince charming type or we could go the complete opposite make the ugliest thing alive let me know down below what you think and if you have any name recommendations we were jeff in dark souls 2 uh dark souls 3 we could be something you know a little bit more epic it could be like blotomir or something blotomir <laughs> what the fuck is blood <laughs> make sure boromir and blood that's kind of cool actually blotomir blood okay anyways he had sacrificed everything for this kingdom and was discovering that ambition without wisdom is like a bird without wings Useless. How could he hope to hold this kingdom? Ambition had inspired his subjects to action, yes, but ambition alone cannot run a country. It cannot substitute the qualities a ruler needs. The king was short-sighted, he knew little, and his story likely would have ended here. But then, from the east, a powerful warrior came, a man wielding a bewitched sword <laughs> so powerful, it was unknown whether he controlled the blade or whether the blade controlled him. Sir Lord. This man was Alon. Sir Alon stands apart from the other characters in our story. 
The others are defined by their wants and ambitions, but Alon has none to speak of. Damn, bro. Thus, it's impossible to say why he came to this land. He just came out of nowhere. What he saw in the king. Perhaps he thought he was destined for great things, or perhaps they became like brothers. Whatever his desires, Alon decided to serve the short-sighted king. <laughs> his wisdom was a light in the darkness, and the king was reborn as a oh, that's such a sick With outfit. wisdom and pride, Alon and the king did a great many things. Their rule was defined by their strength, and the kingdom was shaped by their union. The king's army was revolutionized under Alon, with the men mastering great bows and slender blades wielded in an eastern fashion. That it all makes sense now. Those fast boyos and their samurai stances make perfect sense. They were taught by the best. The king, as many kings before him, found himself enraptured with fire and all it represented. He appointed a master of pyromancy, a man named Egil, who would go on to grant fire a will of its oh. own. Egil adored his bull-headed king and was awarded a great ornamental minotaur helm. Huh. The minotaur, half man, half bull, would come to symbolize the stubbornness and bestial strength of the king and his kingdom. For even with Alon's counsel, the king remained short-sighted and reckless. So like a bull, he charged ahead, savoring his momentum. Damn. To sustain his country, the king sacrificed the land. Past the hunting grounds in the copse lay a place called Harvest Valley. The king exploited the land here so thoroughly that poison seeped from the earth, Whoa. but it mattered not. The stubborn king persisted, adapting his workers and driving the slaves ever harder. The bounty of ore found here was high, so the kingdom became wealthy and well supplied. <laughs> That's a beautiful Within transition. The valley, great relics of times long past were uncovered, kingdoms from long ago sunken and forgotten to time. A warning existed here. But the king was blind to it. He did not seek to learn from past kingdoms buried beneath the earth. Rather, he intended to profit from their passing. And so, when the scorching iron scepter was found, everything changed. With heat, you can fuel, create, destroy. Is there any explanation as to how we go from Harvest Valley to the Iron Keep via elevator? Is there any, maybe he'll cover it in this episode, but so far he hasn't. I was kind of hoping that he would by now. It's almost four minutes. In. Is there any fucking explanation aside from just laziness or is that it? Just let's connect to completely polar opposite areas via elevator and somehow go from a windmill to a volcanic land. Make it make sense. It doesn't. It just doesn't. You know, I'm, maybe I'm looking into it too deep. Let's just continue. It's one of the simplest forms of energy and thus it's one of the most useful. With this artifact, the King of Ven revolutionized his kingdom. Smelting iron became trivial. There were no bounds to what he could create. Iron melted, shifted, and was brought under his control, as if he held sway over the forces of life and creation. The kingdom's warriors were equipped in iron armament. <laughs> so Hulking annoying. great suits of armor were brought to life. Hated these the guys king too. curated a palace made entirely of iron, and some legends even say that he tried to create a dragon out of iron. Wow. Driven by the same fated lunacy as the kings before him. I would have loved to see presiding that. Presiding over his great age, the Iron King knew unparalleled power. None could stand in his way, and any who would try would be crushed under his might. Jeez. Be that as it may, the Iron King still faced challenges. All the iron in the world could not cure the undead curse, but not for lack of trying on the King's part. He sought to shackle and imprison all undead in iron, converting the cops to a hunting ground and prison where undead, not animals, were the prey. It seemed oh fruitless, God. however, and the hollowed undead continued to multiply even within the ranks of those hunting them. In his rage, the Iron King built a great circular colosseum to torture the undead. <laughs> right. They were ritually let out of their cells to be run down by the executioner chariot, oh God. unable to escape and unable to die. The punishment for offending the Iron King's might was harsh, even if undeserved. These things became reflections of the king's conceit, hallmarks of his reign. 
Bro, it, it does not get any more dark than that. That is actually fuck. I actually feel bad for the undead in this land. Like, they did not treat them this bad in Dark Souls 1, bro. Like, they were out to get them, man. Keep me in the cell. If I was an undead, keep me in the cell, dude. C bring me food once in a while. Asylum demon over there chilling. I'm in my cell. Don't. I don't want to come out. I'm good. This moment, a terrible woman who would be his ruinous queen set course for the kingdom. And then, at the peak of the Iron King's rule, his friend walked away. Oh. Alon was gone. What? His distaste left unspoken. The king was alone. Ha! How Sir alone! <laughs> God, I hate myself. But Alon dared to leave him. The king's might was iron, his right to rule unchallenged. He could not suffer the indignity, would not. So he tracked his old friend to a far off keep. He saw that Alon had brought some of the king's own men with him and had posted them as guards, knowing the king would come after him. Damn. But the Iron King had grown powerful and Alon's knights were no match for his might. At the top of the tower, Alon waited for his king oh, to meet him. In the shiniest goddamn room of all time, man. Who was doing the floors in this place, man? Because I would... You know what? It was probably Sirloin. He was probably so goddamn bored in that empty ass room. You know, he just got a little wipe, started, started polishing. It is so fucking nice, bro. It's like a damn near perfect reflection. I want that. One day. One day I shall have this floor. I'm going to manifest it. One day I shall have a room. I don't care if it's a closet. It'll it'll be this. It'll be this shiny. Yes, I have spoken. Once, the question the king might have asked was why. Why had Alon left damn. him? But he had been king for a long time, and his arrogance had grown. So when the two men clashed, their ties were forgotten. The run back to Sirloin. I saw a lot of people struggle with it. And I struggled with it myself too, a few times. But for the most part, it wasn't actually that bad. I didn't, like, I, I was re I was seeing comments that this was the worst run back in the entire game. Obviously, I think aside from Frigid Outskirts, like, this was, like, the second runner-up. I really didn't find it that that challenging. Like, really. I think the one for the Blue Demon was actually worse, in, in all honesty. This one was actually, you could just run past a lot of people. Obviously, you get if you get caught, you're fucked, but it's kind of the deal with every single run back. They had come far together ever since the days when the Iron King was just a small lord on a small throne. Alon had helped him become the man he was today and he paid dearly for it. For once, Alon would have avoided every blow, but now it was the king who overwhelmed the teacher. Damn. Alon took his own life in the end, dying with honor instead of to the king's hand. Oh, I have heard that if you kill Sirloin, uh, and if he doesn't touch it, he doesn't touch you. Like he does this. This is like a this is like a, a in samurai culture. This is like a, a respect thing. I think. I think it was similar in Ghost of Tsushima. Tsushima. I hope I'm saying that right. I played that game briefly. I didn't really finish it. Would maybe love to do a whole playthrough on it. But I forget the name, but there's a specific name for this action. I find this shit to be so heavy metal. <laughs> it's like, bro, you defeated me so bad that I'm just gonna head and do the job for you. <laughs> so gangster. The memory we experience doesn't end with Alon's death, as you would expect. When we step inside a memory, we see it through to the end. The king walked into the adjacent room after Alon departed, and what he saw there would steal this memory in his mind forever. In this room, Alon had kept the king's old throne, a reminder of the king's humble origins. A keepsake from the time he had traveled to the king's land, offering his servitude and friendship to the man who would become the Iron King. The memory ends here. Nurtured properly, man's ambition allows us to take flight. On ambition's back, we reach greater heights, and kingdoms are elevated alongside the man. But if man looks back and sees not where he has been, then on which path does he travel? The Iron King had lost his way, and now he had lost a friend and mentor as well. From this point onwards, we see evidence that this event had broken the man. After Alon departed, the Iron King named his knights after Sir Alon, for they were loyal to him more than the Iron King. He took Alon's armor back to his home, enshrining it and locking it below his current towering Iron Throne. This bonfire below the throne came to be known as Smelter Throne Bonfire. His pyromancer Egil had experimented with giving fire a will of its own, and the king had become adept at infusing suits of iron with souls, 
Now, towards the end of his rule, he crafted one more. A terrifying <laughs> suit of black iron that would come to represent the demons he now held. Jeez. It's implied he infused it with Alon's soul, for the demon he created took on the combat style of his old friend, battling with inhuman leaps into the air, oh, shit, true. and the ability to infuse its sword with fire by plunging it into its belly just true. like Alon had done. The lore is unclear on what happens next. Some of it says that the earth spouted fire with a smelter demon arising from the flames. It says that the short-sighted king was incinerated by the creature in one swing, and his castle devoured in a sea of flames. The other side of the lore says that the king hurled himself into the magma, perhaps in agony over what he had done to his friend. <laughs> Though, in the end, Damn. the Queen of Ruin arrives at the kingdom and finds no king or country. The short-sighted king had sunk below the scorching iron, and his iron rule sunk with him. If this video added a bit of depth to the experience you had yes. with the game, then let me know. That's my goal here on YouTube. If you want to become a part of the small oh, group the goat. that directly supports me. The fucking goat, man. Go support this man, he clearly needs it. <laughs> the raven and the royal Agus. Gwyn, Lord Ag of Sunlight, was the first Agus. Lord of Light. Whatever. He feared the darkness, feared what it would do to his age of fire. So he surrounded himself with powerful allies, even splitting his own soul so that their power could be greater. They would all fail him in the end. Most abandoned the kingdom. Oh. One went mad, another tried <laughs> to relight the first flame, but none compared to the treachery of the four kings. The four kings who ruled over New Londo were praised for their foresight, yet still they succumbed to the temptations of the Abyss. In exchange for the art of life drain, the four kings gave up their kingdoms to Dark. These were the events of long, long ago, and yes. today no one remembers the kings' names. However, names change, but the story remains the same, and four kings again lose their kingdoms to the Abyss. One of the four is Vendrick, the present Lord of Light. <laughs> like Gwyn before him, nice. Vendrick surrounded himself with allies he trusted. He favoured simple warriors, who staked their every battle on strength alone, and he valued knowledge of all things. My lord made magnificent findings on souls, an accomplishment for the ages. He vanquished the four great ones and built this kingdom upon their souls. Our king has watched over this land since ages long, long ago. The man was born to rule. When he heard that the giants from across the sea held a threat to his kingdom, he vanquished them and claimed their strength. When the Iron Kingdom fell, Vendrick sent his soldiers to claim the replete stores of iron held in Broom Tower. And when the undead curse threatened his own kingdom, Vendrick created monstrosities in the name of the greater good. Did we fight Everything that one? he did, he did for his kingdom. That was weird looking. To serve him, the king had two he valued above all others, Raim and Velstad. These nice. men were known as the left and right arms of the king, even though they were as different as night and day. Raim, the darker brother, cared deeply for his king. He sought the man's admiration and saw Vendrick as a regal father figure. His great shield was emblazoned with a great raven, an omen of death, but it was Raim's favorite bird. So this great hard. shield would one day be the only thing left of him in Drang Laic, a foreshadowing of his fate. Valstad, the right arm of the king, was always at Vendrick's side, as if he were his lord's own shadow. They say Drang Laic is no place for any cleric with ambition, yet Valstad had risen to the top and remained the exception to his lord's disregard of miracles. Such the lore a cool tells boss, us man. that Velstart was lured to Drang Laic from a faraway land, but forgot even why he came. You can trace the man's origins to the sunken kingdom of Shulva, where even now, amongst the ruins, a wrathful queen summons a follower in his image. Such was his loyalty. This queen brought destruction to her people and to her king. She rose to power by gaining favor with the king and by singing to the ancient dragon they worshipped. When the king of Shulva realized her true nature, it was already too late. 
The ancient dragon awoke and spewed poison over the entire city <laughs> until only Burn, Alana, bitch. the squalid queen, remained. Or if Felstart is indeed. Do you burn when you get poison? Probably. Rot? I don't know, man. I'm just trying to say something. It's been three minutes. All right. From Shulva, one has to wonder how he didn't see history repeating itself. For the darkness was rising, and his king was in danger. Alana was not the only child of dark seeking a king. A woman named Nishandra arrived in Drangleic and began courting the current king. I love how everyone either just arrives or gets lured to, or you just kind of appear and then you just don't remember where you, why you're there, where you came from. It's like, does anyone know anything in here? <laughs> she warned our Lord of the looming threat across the seas, of the giants. The, the king giants. crossed the ocean and defeated the giants with the queen at his side. There was no better way to seduce Fendrick, and the queen knew it. He valued this kingdom above all else and would vanquish any enemy to keep it safe. So one has to ask, were the giants ever a threat? Or were they simply a target Nishandra used to gain Vendrick's trust? Aww. Regardless, Vendrick conquered the giant's homeland and counted the battle as one. The queen brought peace to this land and to her king. A peace so deep, it was like the dark. A man can be judged by the company he keeps and the company Vendrick kept was loyal indeed. Valstat the Royal Aegis would follow his king into darkness if need be. But there is a difference between loyalty to a king and loyalty to a kingdom. So only one saw Nishandra for what she truly was, while the other was blinded by faith. Oh. Rain. Rain was denounced as a traitor for speaking for his kingdom, but oh. against the king and queen. Oh, Belstad, utterly faithful towards the crown, would vanquish Rain for daring to question the monarchy. So the two arms of the king clashed, Damn. instead of facing the true threat. Nishandra had eliminated any threats to the kingdom, and had found a king blinded by love. She was perfectly poised to usurp the throne, and Rain <gasps> saw it. Bro, this is some like fucking Game of Thrones shit, man. Like this could so easily be like an amazing series you know what i'm saying like imagine if like fucking hbo picked this up <laughs> that shit would go so hard king's tragic flaw was his pride and velstat's flaw was his mind also what's with the sorry i'm I gonna back it up a bit i've been pausing a lot i've noticed through vadi's dark souls 2 lore videos like he always uses he mainly uses like well not mainly he's portraying uh, he's portraying the characters that he's speaking of but in the last one we watched he was using like this female character and I noticed that like the females in this game uh, look way like their characteristics feel a lot like more polished than well I mean I only have fucking baby face to compare it to and honestly every male character I've seen without a helmet kind of looks like baby face so <laughs> I feel like they went a little bit more detail with the with the female characters which is kind of cool but poised to usurp the throne and Rain saw it the king's tragic flaw was his pride, and Velstat's flaw was his mindless faith. For without tolerating those who challenge us, how can we grow? The light is always moving forward, and the darkness will only win when the light stops seeking it out. With the kingdom at peace, Nishandra had halted the kingdom's momentum, and darkness crept closer. Velstad should have recognized the pattern that took place long ago in Shulva, both of his kings were being manipulated by a child of dark, yeah. yet Velstat did nothing to stop it happening again. His faith in his king was absolute, the truth irrelevant. The king valued strength and loyalty, and both were on display here. Velstat fought for his king, Raim for the fate of his kingdom. Both were loyal, both were powerful, yet Velstat was the victor. <laughs> Rain was not killed for his treason. Which side would you guys be on, Rain or Velstat? Would you want to save your kingdom or would you want to save your king? Something to think about, you know? He was exiled. His strength had not been enough, so he left the kingdom in search of greater strength. He would never return. Damn. He had learned that being right is meaningless without power to back it up. Anyone could see that the kingdom was deteriorating under Nishandra's rule, yet Velstat's faith had overpowered the truth. 
Velstart had come from a kingdom where a dark queen remained, so perhaps Raim set out to check if other kingdoms had suffered the same fate. So it was that he found himself in Broom Tower, a place that had once belonged to the Iron King before his fall. It was common knowledge that the Iron King had taken no queen, so what Raim found there must have chilled him and confirmed his fears about Nishandra. The entire tower had been enveloped by a black fog. It repelled any who came close, haunting suits of armor and fighting off any soldiers who attempted to enter. However, Raim was not most soldiers. A stalwart warrior, Raim had the ability to expunge the black fog. He was strong and tracked the black fog to its source at the base of the tower. Amongst the remnants of a past kingdom covered in ash was Nadalia, the Ashen Maiden. Hmm. Nadalia arrived at this tower seeking a king, but was too late. I don't. I don't ever think we got all the the soul fragments from her. Like we didn't. We didn't take out all the red guys. Now I'm remembering. I, I meant to do that. I completely forgot. Does anything cool happen if we catch? If we if we break all those uh, red thingies that give you uh, Nassandra? Is it Nassandra's soul? The one. The one he was just talking about. The king she seeked had already sunk below the molten iron, and his rule had passed. Dispirited, this child of dark made Broom Tower her home in the place she might have ruled alongside her king. Perhaps Raim's original intent was to banish Nadalia, Nadalia, the Dark Queen of Broom Tower. If he could do this, then he could return with proof to his kingdom and make his king see the truth. Right. At some point after entering Broom Tower though, this changed. Just like Raim, Nadalia was deprived of a king and kingdom. Perhaps they found some mutuality in this, for Raim decided to trust this child of dark, allowing her to cling to his sword in her miasmic form. Raim was reborn, granted true purpose under a newfound mother rather than a regal father. Aww. Which begs the question, could such a queen be evil, or was Raim another victim of a dark queen's manipulation? <gasps> Bro, I swear to God, every time I watch these videos, like, yes, he answers a lot of questions, but a lot of the times I end up with more questions. <laughs> that is awesome, though. Wow. After Raim left Drang Lake, the kingdom collapsed. The giants invaded with a revenge in their hearts, and Nishandra took the throne, forcing Vendrick into hiding. Valstad followed his king into the undead crypt, where he would guard him in darkness. He's a forever. real one. Raim remained in Brim Tower protecting the Ashen Maiden from harm. And then you come, seeking answers in Empty Kingdom. <laughs> Fuck everybody up. <laughs> also, is, is there ever a, an answer to why there's always footprints in uh, Drang Lake Castle? I heard two things in the comment section. One was ashes, the other one was actually rain, because there was like an open hole, there's like a hole in the ceiling and it was raining. I think it's more, I think it's the ashes, no? I feel like that would make the most sense. Like, cause it's so old. I don't fucking know. If anyone says the answer, let me know. Let us know. This video is supported by ah. Patreon.com. Shout out Patreon, bro. The, the original OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> what you guys know about Patreon? Does people still use Patreon? Maybe, I don't know. Great time to plug in channel memberships though. Hey, if you want to become a member of the channel. <laughs> Just click that join button. We'd love to have you. <laughs> All right, guys. The Ivory King is next. And then we just have Luca Teal. I personally thought the Ivory King was one of the coolest fights. I think in Dark Souls 1 and 2 together combined. Like, it was one of the coolest fights. The entrance to it, the mechanics before it, in terms of how we had to collect soldiers to, like, basically fight alongside us was awesome. The fact that we were, like, in an ice land for like three and a half four hours just to like fall through a hole and see so much fire and flames like it was the contrast was so awesome and his entry literally felt like a wwe entrance like it was fucking cool man and i would love to just like replay that fight like over and over again it was it was beautiful it was great the run back was super chill great boss i, I absolutely loved it and the score was amazing he wasn't too tough it was chef's kiss Voila. I still think on that creature from the abyss that oh, preyed shit. upon me. My faculties were far from lucid, but I quite clearly sensed certain emotions. I forgot her name. nostalgia, a lost joy, an object of obsession, and a sincere hope to reclaim it. <laughs> Could these thoughts belong to the beast from the abyss? Yeah, what's she looking at? But if that were true. <laughs> 
Then perhaps it is no beast after all. Four queens remain in empty kingdoms, all of them fragments of this creature that was vanquished long ago. We have seen examples of their evil in what remains. One stands alone in the ruins of her home, another rose from the ashes of a lost kingdom, and yet another gained the love of her king and used it to force him into a dark corner, where he would forever think on his mistakes. But you will hear the tale of a fourth queen before the end of this story, a fourth and she queen. will make you question everything that you have previously held true. What? Alsana, queen of the Ivory King, also stands alone in an empty king. That's what she looks like? What the fuck? We never actually got to the top of that. And I, apparently there was a way that we could have done that. Pretty sad that we didn't, but she looks pretty cool, man. She looks pretty run down, though. She, 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 I don't think she's doing too hot. You, approaching the land noise. This was a cool moment, Turn too. Turn back. This dead city has nothing to offer. Go back. Do not seek the old chaos. <laughs> nor its twisted flame. Why do we build that walls? whole thing? Well, there are two reasons. The first is more common. It's to protect something precious. But the second is much more rare and much more terrifying. It's to keep something from getting out. The walls of Alayam Lois are those second kind of walls. The city is a Pandora's box, built to contain one of the most ancient evils the world ever knew. <sighs> so the cool. chaos. The chaos did not always exist. Ooh. It was born of fear and desperation long ago in the Age of Lords. Theirs was the earliest civilization, Gross. built upon the first flame ever to be. Four powerful beings derived their strength from this flame, for it gave them souls. One soul of dark, one of light, a soul of death and a soul of life. Inevitably, this first flame began to dwindle, and so too did the Lords. The Witch of Isolith, with great power over flame, thought to focus the power of her life soul to create a new flame, a second flame that could replace the first, so that their age would be ah. So <laughs> I fucking knew there was a good obviously the, obviously there's a connection but just to look at it one more time man this episode was also a bitch man this was the episode that I lost the freaking footage no I, I lost my face cam and the audio and I had the voice over it till like six in the morning god it just the, the, everything about the bed of chaos it just I I hate so much just mainly because of what it took to film and to edit and to just get through and and, and to fight it and just Ah, oh, dude, I, I might skip this part of Chuck. <laughs> Witch and her daughters initiated this ritual, but something went wrong. The flame she created was too powerful, and she failed to control it. Damn. This was the birth of chaos. The witch and her sisters were either killed or malformed, and the witch herself became the bed of all chaos, deep below Isolith, a city lost to the twisted flame. Countless demons spewed forth from the inextinguishable chaos, infesting Isolith until the land was overrun. Damn. Lifetimes later, the bed of chaos would be defeated, but not destroyed. And after the rise and fall of many civilizations, the chaos rose again in the country of Ferossa, wow. on a barren plain where Alayam Lois was to be built. The Ferossans cool. were the ones who dealt with the chaos, for it had erupted on their land. Ferossans are famed for their god of war, valuing valor and combat prowess. Notable men of Ferossa were shieldless Lothian, who grew tired of the frailty of human foes and set off to slay dragons. There was Vengal, the mad beast of the battlefield, who claimed the heads of countless enemies, and there were the Ferocian Lion Knights, <laughs> feared for their nimble two-handed swordplay. Wow. But the highest ranking knight, and the most famed of them all, was the Ivory King of Ferossa. After taking his crown, they say he was the first to swing his sword in times of need, be it for his homeland or for his people. And Damn. his sword was required far to the north, for the old chaos had resurfaced there once more. This land is barren, cursed by the old chaos. It gave birth to atrocities, and the people fled in fear. Damn! Until our lord, the Ivory King, came. With his sword, his soul, and his Lois Knights, the Ivory King fought back the chaos. When it was contained, they built Alayam Lois, a vast rampart city. 
golems patrolled the walls, given life by the Ivory King, and they were charged with the containment of the creatures of the chaos within. Hmm. A cult of priestesses was formed, who devoted themselves to a ritual that appeased the ancient flame. The king himself erected his throne at the very entrance to chaos, for he wished to serve as the first line of defense. Any creature of chaos that threatened his city would have to pass him first, and the king would not falter. It was here, in Aleum Lois, that the Ivory King took a queen, Alsana. It appears she was a woman of great power, for she possessed the same talent as the priestesses did, and she quelled the chaos flame below. Together, in a city cut off from the rest of the world, and facing constant peril, they were wed, and they stood together despite the hardship. Wow. Like the other queens before her, Alsana was born of dark. She wed her king out of selfishness, for she saw that the king of Ferossa was strong, and intended to find safety by his side. <laughs> Nevertheless, the Ivory King loved her, and supported this child of the abyss even as he fought against the flames of chaos. Two ancient evils weighed upon the king, one in front of him, and one at his side. But even so, he weathered them both, for himself and for his people. There is evidence that having a child of dark by his side weighed upon oh, the king. The worst. He has seven pets, and two are found seven. in the outskirts of Aleum Lois. Oh, we knew that. We knew he had seven. Yes, we read that somewhere. These two, I did not defeat. Okay. And I was actually very close. And if I stuck to that... Uh, Hold on, let me go to the next frame here. Um, <laughs> if I had stuck to the original strategy, I would have done it. I know it. I, I would have done it, but it was the run back that got to my head. So many hours of running aimlessly in a fucking blizzard that just completely ruined my appetite for destruction and for victory. So I gave up like a coward and you guys all saw it and it is what it is. Just wanted to say that with the mercy killings of those who were exiled from the city. Now fuck them up. Blood and Zalan are great cats, brothers of Ava, oh, a tiger cats. that remains in the city itself. The two outside are cursed with a dark aura, and one has to wonder whether they became this way due to the presence of Alsana, for they are kept out of sight where none would report on their true nature or what the Child of Dark was doing to those who stood beside her. Inevitably, there came a moment where the Ivory King sensed the degradation of his own soul. Damn. In this moment, he made a decision. He would not run from chaos. Rather, he would give himself to chaos in order to appease the flame. Without a word, he left his home, he left his wife, and he left his country, but not without one final act. For before he set off to strike at the heart of chaos, he entrusted everything to Alsana. Upon his parting, he handed her a Laum Lois, the city, and a ceremonial blade by its namesake. The twin blades of a Laum Lois, one light and one dark, were entwined as the Ivory King and his Dark Queen once were. He knew Alsana was a child of dark all along, but he said nothing. He believed her to be more than the sum of her parts, and so she was. The king's belief in the queen allowed her to rise above her dark nature. It was his final gift to her. But then he left, never to return. What a fucking badass, never man. To be, to be, to be, to be. The king was drained of figure, figure, figure and plunged and into the chaos' his heart. His heart, his heart, his heart, his heart. Aleum Lois was frozen in time. Its leader lost. I remain here. To contain the chaos, honoring my lord's wishes. Though I am yet to know your name, stranger, will you lend me your strength? I have but one wish. That my dear lord might be free from that unspeakable chaos. Many of Aleum Lois's faithful knights followed their lord into the chaos. The king's dutiful subjects waited patiently for his homecoming. But it was too long a wait to bear. The knights reborn will follow your word. The path to chaos is now open. And please, do all you can. Chaos claimed the Ivory King, 
and many knights of Lois. Many were burned along with their lord, and Jeez. to this day they burn in agony alongside their once proud king, lacking all sense of self, and driven only to expunge those who might disturb the flame, even former compatriots. But those who survived fight with us now, commanded to strike down their former comrades and their own king. Oh, the sacrifice is total, and they freeze the portals so that we may face Chaos's new champion. Wow. What makes a king? Some say that it is birthright, while others call it destiny. Perhaps it is not important, as long as the king's name serves to unite his people. The Ivory King was the greatest king we have seen so far. His sacrifice saved the world from chaos, and he was not changed by the Child of Dark at his side. In fact, she alone remains, despite her fearful nature, and watches over chaos out of respect for her lord. Such was his influence over her. For Alsana, we free the Ivory King's soul from the grip of chaos. You've granted my one wish. My dear lord has departed. Now, I have no regrets. I was born amidst the dark. Long ago, in the depths of the abyss, my father perished. The dark shattered into tiny pieces, one of which was me. How frightened I was. A frail thing. Born from but a splinter of dark. I felt that I might simply disappear. I am, in fact, the incarnation of my father's fears. I saw that the king of this land was strong. I sought him only to sustain myself, to smother my fears. Now, I realize that he may have known all along. I was born of fear, and my lord provided comfort. And so, here I remain, heiress to my lord's wishes, watching over chaos. Until the end of time. My father, once human, succumbed to dark. And later, set in motion its raging advance. The dark wanders, guided by its thirst for souls. But perhaps, man is no different. If a person's identity- What the fuck? He just- <laughs> Damn, bro. There's, there's no outro or anything. Oh my god, dude. That one, that one actually almost- That one actually almost got me. Prepare to cry. I was not prepared for that. I don't know why, but that just- That hit so hard. I don't know if it was like the music in the background, which definitely helps a lot. Like her saying that to us in that room with no music or anything, just- did not hit the same, man. And I've said that before, you know, it'd be kind of cool if they maybe added a little bit of music here with dialogue and whatnot, but I get it. I get it. From Soft does their thing and, you know, they're they're great at it. So this isn't like a, I wish they did this. I just said, I just mean like it might be, it would be cool if maybe they, you know, sprinkle some of that in. I don't know, but music for me just like really makes me feel, really sets the tone for me, you know, and that was a very joyful, but also really sad moment for her, especially after we, you know, rescued the Ivory King. Like that was really beautiful. That was really, really beautiful. I think that might be my favorite kind of storyline. I guess you could call it like between kings and actually sirloins and the iron king is a really really cool uh relationship i mean all of these have had such amazing uh background stories and lore and everything i mean do you can make a fucking 10 episode series on each one of these episodes um like Game of Thrones style. It'd be, it'd be fucking awesome. Well, guys, that leaves us to Lucatil of Amira. Let's freaking jump in, man. I, uh, I've i I've loved this series so far. This is, I mean, as expected, I, I fucking love Audi Video so much. If a person's identity depends on qualities that can crumble, he or she is in danger of despair. For without a sense of self, we are nothing, and the world is unmoved by our existence. 
If everything should fade, what will be left of me? We live in fear of this loss of self, our existential crisis. I'm called Lucatil. I come from Mira, a land of knights. My sword is always ready. There is only one way up in Mira. Join the Order and prove yourself in battle. My family had little fortune and no name. I had to carve out a piece of the world for myself. Mm. With two things. My sword and my loyalty to my lord. I was raised to wield a sword from birth. Life was hard, but I never gave it a second thought. I had swift success on the battlefield and quickly attained respectable stature. Cool. And then I... And then I came here to... Who are you? To forget we everything. We Lake seeking answers. Our flesh, like many others of humanity, is branded with the dark sign of the undead. While marked, an undead's memory of their humanity will fade, until only a hollow husk remains. Hmm. Undeath robs us of our past, and in doing so, it robs us of our fate. Lucatil was marked, and she bears it with shame, for it forced her out of her homeland. Across many kingdoms, the appearance of this curse and those who bear it has been met with fear and hatred. The King of Iron bound the undead in chains and tortured them endlessly. The current King of Light did much the same, sending them to an inescapable Bastille. It is not so strange to think that the land of Mira would have reacted in much the same manner, right. damning Lucatil if it was ever discovered what she had become. Have you heard of the undead? These poor souls affected by the curse. An undead gradually loses his humanity until his wits degrade completely. Finally, he turns hollow and preys upon others. And a hollow can never be human again. One can skirt this wicked fate only with the help of the souls found here. Assuming, of course, that the legends are true, I can only hope that they are. The mask hides Lucatil's shame. It is said that Drenglaic holds the souls that can cure the curse. Oh my god, I never noticed she had a freaking mark on her face. What the hell? <laughs> it makes perfect sense why she wore the mask. Shit, I never picked up on that. Many adventurers rose to the call, some driven by greed, others by desperation. For Lucatil, Drenglaic holds salvation. Huh. I found my thoughts growing hazy. My memories are fading, oldest first. The curse is doing its work upon me. I am frightened, terribly so. If everything should fade, what will be left of me? Existential despair. The curse took her knighthood, the thing she devoted her life to. Lucatil's self was based on her prowess as a knight and her loyalty to her lord. Forced to leave for Drangleic, what does she have left? She will lose herself, given time. She will lose that which made her what she is. Oh... You... My thoughts... Are very... Scattered. <laughs> What is this curse? The question rings in my mind, but I haven't the focus to answer it. Loss frightens me no end. Loss of memory, loss of self. If I were told that by killing you, I would be freed of this curse, then I would draw my sword without hesitation. I don't want to die. I want to exist. I would sacrifice anything, anything at all for this. Oh, man. It shames me. Oh. But it is the truth. 
Sorry, I know this is like a pretty heartfelt moment. And Luca Teal is an amazing, amazing character. Like seeing all of her dialogue kind of put together and, you know, really understanding where she came from and the mark and, you know, how she wears it a shame. Like that's as sad as it can get, I think, for like any character, any any person. Like she has this like constant just dread of existing uh, because of her curse and she would do anything to get rid of it and she can't. That is so fucking sad. But the reason I pause though is because of these goddamn spiders, man. Even right now, through this blurry just pause screen. I'm getting chills. I'm getting fucking chills. It's horrendous. It's I don't know what it was. My candle went out. Ah oh, fuck. I need to get another candle. It's a crucial part of Lauren Chill. I got it. I don't even know where I got these, but they smell pretty fucking good. Alright, look at Teal, here we go. Sometimes I feel obsessed with this insignificant thing called self. Even so, I am compelled to preserve it. Am I wrong to feel so? No. Surely you do the same in my shoes. Maybe we're all cursed. From the moment we're born. All of us Shit, face dude. this same despair. Cursed or not, there is no meaning in the world, beyond what meaning we give it. Despite this, we seek meaning. For a life free of purpose simply means that we are able to imprint our own. We are all a product of our past, and this shapes our future. But an undead is doomed to lose his past, and thus fated to be robbed of his future. Oh. Lucatil has one hope, to find her past and recover who she was. I had an older brother. We learned to fence together. He became the most decorated swordsman in all of Mirror. I never even compared to him. In fact, I never beat him. Not once. Oh. But then, one day, he was gone. Lost without a trace. Now I'm certain that he was taken by the curse. If only someone would hear my tale. My brother must have come here, too. Soon I may forget even about him. An undead gradually loses his humanity until his wits degrade completely. Finally, he turns hollow and preys upon others. You... What's become of you? Oh, shit. Oh, my dear brother. That's who that was. I won't die in this foul place. She had to fight her fucking brother, man. You... Who are you? That was hard. Oh. No. Forgive me. I know you. Yes, of I'm course. The boy, Jeff. How goes your journey? Horrible. We find Lucatil here after her help in countless battles and right before her finding her brother. It is assumed that they have fought, but it is not known. Perhaps she never met him. Perhaps it's better that way, for he has lost himself and attacks others to rob them of their humanity. Regardless, Lucatil never progresses further. So it is here, outside of Aldia's keep, that her journey ends. I know not what you seek in this faraway land, but I pray for your safety. My name is Lucatil. I beg of you, remember my name, for I may not myself. <sighs> Existential despair is a universal human condition. There is no meaning in the world, and yet we seek it insatiably. Hey guys, if you liked that video, then you can click the bonfire. Damn, he just the of the small he just dropped the fucking bomb on us right at the end. My God. Yeah, we all suffer from it, man. There's nothing we can do about it, but it's the way she goes, man. Luca Teal, we shall remember you till the end of time. Luca Teal of Mira. Everybody put in the comments. Luca Teal of Mira shall live. Among Us. Maybe that's a little long. Just put an R.I.P. look at Teal or something. Dude. Dark Souls 2 fucking slaps. Alright. 
Dark Souls 2 fucking slaps. I will not stand for any slander on the lore. Some of the mechanics, sure. Enemy placement, sure. ADP, sure. Lazy level design, sure. An incredible amount of empty rooms. Okay, I'm done. But dude, this lore is fucking awesome. I mean, I know Miyazaki didn't direct this one, um, or at least he didn't have that big of a part on it uh, as much as he did the other games. I believe he was working on Bloodborne during Dark Souls 2. But the craft and the creativity and the passion for these games is still there because they wouldn't have written such rich characters if they didn't give a fuck about it. So I stand for Dark Souls 2 when it's lower, man. This is this has been amazing. I want to end it on this note, but I did notice there's another one. So <laughs> I don't even know what the Archdrake sect is, but it's only seven minutes. We're going to watch it. If you're going to skip this one, just know that those are my final remarks on Dark Souls 2. I love this shit. It was great. The lore slaps. The characters are incredible. It touches on so many life themes that both reflect our human experience as well as the game and 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 and, and the story of the game. I am gonna watch this last one, but if you're if you're heading out here because you don't care about the Arch Arch Drake sect, uh, make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this video. And Dark Souls Three comes out on Monday, so I better see you there. Let's play this. One. Let's go down a branch of lore and branch see where of lore. it takes us. The point of this series is to give characters meaning and depth, to bring parts of the story back to Oh, is life. this gonna be like a bunch of characters? You would first notice the Arcdrake sect as you traveled through the shrine of Amana. Oh, those Little dudes? About the order, though their well-honed miracles and unwavering faith in the face of death made them worthy rivals to Drangleic forces in their day. Oh. The magic of the Arcdrake was very powerful, especially if you versed them before the patch. These men and women were a part of a sect which means that they are an offshoot of a larger religion or group. Huh. In this case, the Archdrakes are a sect of Lindelt, which is a country known for its clerics and miracles. So the Archdrakes are a small, separate religion to the main religion of Lindelt. But do you want oh, to know sure, what's cool. most interesting about the Archdrake sect? They're hiding something. The secrets of Lindelt rituals are protected by the Archdrake sect, and only a select few are given access to their canon of knowledge which includes the truthful origins of the Archdrake sect itself. Cool. I think From has given us the clues to trace the Archdrake sect's origins. It's never explicitly stated where they're from, but there are so many hints, and it all starts with the description of the shield that teases us with their origins. The Slumbering Dragon Shield. Long ago, in a city named Shulva, there was a race that discovered a great slumbering dragon worshipped its magnificence and perished by its side. Shulva was a city founded on miracles and faith in an ancient dragon. As such, the development of its sorceries was stunted as they were considered- Oh, that's awesome. Similarly, in Lindelt, a country known for its clerics and their miracles, sorcery was believed to be a profane practice. <laughs> but as with anything, such beliefs are part faith and part front, hypocrisy. This guy's just shooting down birds, man. This reminds me, for Dark Souls 3, I um, I kind of want to do a similar build to what we did in Elden Ring. I don't know why, but this kind of came to mind the other day. And I know I've been saying that I want to go like full heavy mode, strength mode, fucking berserk swords and stuff. But while I still want to do that, I kind of want to try like a bunch of like different sorceries and, you know, carry around a little Gandalf staff and, you know, shoot people down with it. We were kind of both using magic and, you know, spells and also, you know, like a, a variety of weapons, shields. Like it was kind of like, I think there's a name for it, like a variety build or, or something like that. I think it would really make the experience really, really fun. Let me know if that's something you'd like to see. And if you have any recommendations for which kind of build we go for, that's kind of what I think would make for the funnest kind of first playthrough. But anyways, let's continue. The secrets of Lindelt rituals came to be protected by the Archdrake sect. And the fact that the two countries shared the same hypocritical distance. Bro, is that Darth Vader? What the fuck? Sorceries definitely helps <laughs> the tell me that doesn't look like Darth Vader from behind <laughs> together so if the slumbering dragon shield places the Arcdrakes in Shulva then how did the Arcdrakes leave to become a part of Lindelt well they must have left Shulva and with the invasion of the Drake blood knights they would have had good reason to hmm. the Drake blood knights led by Soyorg invaded Shulva and fought with its inhabitants these knights worshipped the blood of dragons, and they were led by oh. Sayorg in a siege to murder Sin, the slumbering dragon. Right. When the slumbering dragon was pierced, however, he awoke and spewed poison over all of Shulva. The Drake blood knights are relevant because their leader, Sayorg, 
has a ring that bears the crest of Drang Lake. Mm. And I mention this because the Archdrakes had a confrontation with Drang Lake. The Archdrake staff states, their well-honed miracles and unwavering faith in the face of death made them worthy rivals to Drang Lake's forces in their day. So if the Drake Blood Knights are from Drang Lake, then these descriptions tie in nicely together. The Drake Blood Knights invade to kill Sin, the slumbering dragon. The Archdrake continue to fight with faith in the dragon, even though the source of their faith is raining down death upon them. It also says, in their day, which implies that the Archdrake oh. Knights had a time when they stood alone, rather than as a sect. If you've watched my Prepare to Cry video on Velstart, then you'll know that I think Velstart of Drang Laic must have existed in Shulva at some point, since there's a mirror image of him down in the depths. Right. So, if that's true, it's likely that some Archdrake Knights managed to leave Shulva as well, joining Drang Laic with Velstart and making their home in the holy country of Lindelt. And I'm assuming Lindelt and Drang Laic are both countries under the same monarchy, for the Archdrake Knights make their new home in the Shrine of Amana <laughs> below Drang Laic Castle. And it's also worth noting that the Archdrake Knights in Shrine of Amana are actually called Archdrake Pilgrims, and the word pilgrim is a word with a lot of religious connotations, essentially meaning that you have to go on a quest to a distant land to prove yourself. Mm. So it could also cool. mean that they're in Shrine of Amana because they're on pilgrimage from Lindelt. I gotta say, the Shrine of Amana does not look as bad as uh, as it once did. I think after going through the, the frigid outskirts, I think I could do Shrine of Amana any day of the week, man. I'm not even gonna lie. I used to not even be able to look at this place. Pretty chill, man. Honestly, Frigid Outskirts takes the cake for ultimate fuckery of areas. And here, in the Shrine of Amana, we find some of the biggest links to Shulva. So even if I'm wrong about how they got to the Shrine, even if you don't agree with me on that, where they came from seems pretty set given all the connections. Oh. A simple observation to start with is how similar the Shrine of Amana is to Shulva it's underground, it's dimly lit, and it's got shallow water. Actually, the perfect example is the Demon of Song Room, which is remarkably boy. similar to the Lair of the Imperfect. Speaking of the Demon of Song, Shulva and the Shrine of Amar oh. are two places where a demon and its priestesses sing to soothe the inhabitants. True. Shulva had a dark queen singing with her priestesses to soothe the dragon in its slumber, and Amana has a Demon of Song singing to the Milfinito to soothe the dead. <laughs> For the Archdrake Knights in Amana, the slumbering dragon continues to be the focus of their faith, the source of their miracles. The Archdrake shields are all inscribed with dragons as a way for the Archdrakes to perform their rituals. And all the item descriptions that say that they keep their rituals and origins a secret say that because they are intricately tied to one another. Their mm. rituals and their origins would be one and the same. That's Lastly, cool, man. There is a bonfire named the Tower of Prayer in both Shulva and the Shrine of Amana, which is what I'm going to leave you guys on. So maybe this video gave you the sources to make your own story about the Archdrake Knights. Maybe you believe that my telling of the story is right, or if nothing else, I hope I made you realize that there's more depth than you might have seen here at first glance. Yeah, seriously. All of these connections are implied, and no description concretely states that there's a connection between Shulva and Drang Laic. So why do I believe it? Well, it's because this is exactly the subtle stuff from wants us to dig for. Right. And you can say it's coincidence, but I prefer to think that there's too many connections for it to be coincidence. And after hearing me talk, you might agree or disagree, but hey, that's the beauty of it. I that. agree. Just because I'm pointing out connections doesn't make it true. What matters is what you believe. This well, video I believe in my you. Prepare to Cry on Sin, the Slumbering Dragon, and my Prepare to Cry on Valstart, oh. the Royal Aegis. And now that you've seen this, you'll probably understand more about those stories, and you'll understand what was going on in the background of those two tales. Right. So, go check those ones out. They're arguably a little bit better I already did. Video. Ah, love you, Vaddy. And love you guys for sticking around, man. What an absolute blast of a series. As always, Vaddy Video comes through with his theories, speculations, beautiful cinematics, and uh, amazing music that always makes me feel like these games would hit just a bit harder if they put a little bit of music into the dialogue scenes. You know, they do amazing with the scores of the bosses, some of the areas. Sometimes I 
just wish there was a little bit of music behind dialogues just to really push that emotion through but i am talking about a game that came out almost nine years ago so why the fuck am i even wasting my time here but this officially wraps up the lauren chill week of Dark Souls 2. I'm so happy that we did this because while I did enjoy Dark Souls 2, I am now realizing how much more went into it, how detailed and how intricate the stories were. And it just makes me really grow a lot more appreciation for the game as a whole. The next episode, the next notification that you get on your phone will be of Dark Souls 3, the first episode. And I am so freaking excited. I'm gonna be recording it tomorrow morning, bright and early. Saturday. Make sure to leave a like. It helps the channel grow. And as always, have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one. Peace. Peace. Ah! I just got wax all over me. Bro, I just got these shorts. That's what I get for trying to do a stupid joke. Anyways, have a good one, guys.